Good day, everyone. You are most warmly welcome to the third Living webinar. Uh, my name is Lena Marcia, and I work for the Finnish Heritage Agency, and I'm the coordinator of the UNESCO Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage here in Finland since 2014. Uh, I'm so happy to see so many people on board this, this day. We have uh, 100 people from 30 countries registered, which clearly shows that the theme of sustainable development and living heritage is of interest in, in many countries around Europe and of course around the world. Today, our topic is understanding the issues and seeking local solutions, living heritage and ecological sustainability. So uh, last time we met a month ago, the theme was on, on uh, economical sustainability and then we go forward in the autumn. Uh, but in today's program, uh, we have interesting presentations coming up. So hopefully Rhys Evans from Norway will start with a presentation on regenerating a new future from the past. Uh, and then Kirstin Möller from the Greenland National Museum and Archives will continue on traditional knowledge in the climate crisis. Uh, after these presentations, we will go into case examples of ecological sustainability. So in our project and also in this webinar, we really want to concretely show what are the connections between sustainability and living heritage. And with these concrete cases and museums and NGOs and the work they do, uh, I think it will become clearer to us all. And we can also learn ways to how to implement this in our own work. Uh, there'll be room for questions and discussions, but don't hesitate to put your comments or questions on the chat box. After a small coffee break, we will go into discussions in small groups. And for many, this is the most rewarding part of our webinar. So please stay also after the break to share your views with colleagues around Europe. Uh, Elisa, would you kindly tell something about the project as we maybe have some brand new people in the event? Yes, indeed. Hello to everybody. My name is Elisa Kratari and I work as the project coordinator for the Living Project. And Living Project started in September 2021. So we've been going on now a bit less than a year and we have uh, at least a year to go on uh, until May 23. That's the current plan. Uh, living stands for creative and living cultural heritage as a resource for the northern dimension region. Uh, it is funded by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Finland, uh, and it focuses uh, on an international scope very much. So it covers the northern dimension region, as it says in the project title, and it covers Nordic and Baltic countries and Poland. Uh, along with the uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, we have co-founders, namely the Northern Dimension Partnership and Culture, a part of this cooperation for Northern Dimension, and obviously the Finnish Heritage Agency that is coordinating the whole thing. But that is uh, the basics of the basics about this project. And let's now take a short look in, into what living is about, and especially about the ways we are working in. Uh, uh, as you saw, we started in 21, and Lena, who has been largely planning this whole project, uh, has taken into account all the time uh, the change in our working environments that we are mostly now working and meeting, or we are a lot now still working and meeting in virtual form. And therefore we take advantage of the virtual tools and platforms. We have been using a special platform called Housebase even for planning these international webinars with our project partners from the nine countries. And here we are now on, on, on Zoom today, having our uh, second of these thematic uh, international webinars on ecological sustainability. And as Lena mentioned, there are a couple of others coming up uh, for social and cultural sustainability in, uh, we are planning to have them in uh, on the, I think it's the second week in September and then and the cultural sustainability in October. 
2022, so later this year. Uh, what else we are doing than having international webinars? Uh, we are indeed um, talking a lot, negotiating these uh, things, especially in the thematic events we had earlier this year with our project partners. And now we are planning to go on to plan and develop further pilot projects uh, in the project partner countries. So, so not only talking about it, how, how to make um, sustainability more concrete, but also testing it in practice. What could be the practical steps and uh, modes of action that could be used to make sustainability a reality? We also involve a, a small research team uh, in this project who focus uh, focus on sustainability and living heritage on, on a more maybe theoretical or umbrella view and they are um, creating analysis about the state of art where we are today in uh, with living heritage and sustainable development in the northern dimension region and we are hoping to have or looking forward actually <laughs> to to have a policy brief about the topic at the end of this project all results that includes results from uh, from the different kind of meetings that we have, um, especially from the pilots and and the research activities results. We are going to collect those all in on a uh, on an online platform that would be open and public for all, so you everybody could be uh, make use of the results of this project also afterwards. And hopefully this living project is then basis for new initiatives, new projects uh, and new networks, partnerships, cooperation. That's, that's what this is about. But then I throw the ball back to you, Lena. And what about sustainability and sustainable sustainability development goals for today? Well, yes, yeah, some of you have seen this slide already in, in our previous events, and this is originally the, the image is from UNESCO materials on sustainable development goals, but we have worked with this in Finland and uh, put, put into the same board both the SDGs and especially the viewpoint of how living heritage can support the sustainable development goals. Feel free to take a snapshot and save it for later purposes. But I think this really nicely illustrates how concretely in, in the work of, of living heritage we can actually tap on sustainability. And just here to bring up some of some few viewpoints. So for example, number two, which is no hunger. So for example, traditional fishing methods, or herbs for aging in nature and in the forest that we will see hopefully soon hear from, from Signe Puchena. So that's one example. Or then number six, which is clean water. So for example, here in Finland, we have this wonderful tradition of washing carpets and especially uh, hand woven rag rugs on the lake shores of lakes and seas and rivers and so on but all the amount of soap is not good for the environment. So now the tradition has changed so that the, the thing that used to be done in the water has now been lifted to the lake sides and river banks and so on. And so that the water will be soaked into the, into the land and not into the waters. Then if we pick up nine, which is industry, innovation and infrastructure, here, for example, the traditional knowledge on building from wood. So this tradition is really strong in Finland. We have our log houses and our wooden houses and cottages, but nowadays also schools are built totally from wood or, or even uh, big block houses and so on. So this tradition is being developed all the time. Then if we take number 12, which is responsible production. So here, for example, crafts and using natu natural materials or natural dyes in coloring, or for example, circular economy at homes. So we really have this all kind of traditions of, of 
what can you make of leftover food that you do not do not throw away anything but you can make wonderful culinary things out of the things you happen to have in your fridge and lastly maybe number 15 which is life on land so i think today we will hear many different kind of examples related to nature and forests how can we pick mushrooms and berries but also how do we use our free time so do we go to the forest or do we take the family out to the lake instead of going to the shopping mall so these kind of things are related to sustainability and, and living heritage. Uh, I lastly want to point out that it is the drops that make out of the ocean. So everything that we do counts and we as individuals or practitioners or we in our working roles can really can really contribute to sustainable development in many ways. Thank you, Lena. Uh, when we have started this project, uh, we started with the nine countries, actually 10 countries, afterwards nine countries. Uh, but as it happens, the, the living project's scope has turned out to be a bit wider, <laughs> which is a very nice thing. Uh, and in the webinar invitation, I, I sent you uh, the link uh, to the living project map that has been evolving since last November. And if you would like to, you can still go and add your own pin there. Lena, if you would like to add the link to the chat so people can find it there. Uh, and if you have already done this, you can also maybe add another if you would like to add there some more information, like a good example of how living heritage and ecological sustainability, for example, uh, have been connected in a certain practice or, or a project example. If you would like to edit it further on, so that's, that's a possibility. Not going uh, into this map more here, because we've seen it a couple of times again already. Uh, I think it's uh, all here for now. About the chat, I would like to remind that please use that also for comments or questions throughout this webinar. Um, but now I think it would be time for, <laughs> for going on with the program, but I'm quite unsure whether Chris is uh, with us yet. So should we, should we change our plans and ask Kirstin instead? Yes, let's start from Greenland and see how the program develops from there. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I'm zooming in with you from Nuuk, the capital of Galatlik Nunat, also known as Greenland. Uh, my name is Kirstina Ivimula, and I'm a PhD fellow at the Nunat de Katosugasivia at the Greenland National Museum and Archives. Um, I am very fortunate to have been invited to give this talk about traditional knowledge and the climate crisis. Uh, my point of departure will be from the Arctic, uh, especially from Galatlid Nunat, uh, Greenland, where the majority of the population is Inuit, the Arctic indigenous culture to whom I also belong. On the agenda today, I would like to highlight climate change and the crisis uh, that it is causing, particularly in the Arctic. I would like to talk a bit about knowledge systems, about traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge. And then I'll use uh, one example, for instance, dog sledding and the art of mushing um, in this presentation. And then I think I'll be out of time. <laughs> so Climate change and crisis. I don't know if any of you remember or recognize this image. Um, it's from 2017. I'd like to contextualize it a bit. Um, so I'll be reading this snippet from Visit Greenland concerning the event that resulted in this image. As the earth warms, more and more permafrost will melt, which may increase the risk of destabilization. Where landslides end in the sea, tsunami waves of varying altitudes will occur, depending on the mass and the speed of the landslide. 
On the 17th of June, 2017, the settlements of Nungat Siak and Ishlok Suit in northwestern Greenland were hit by a tsunami that had been triggered by a giant landslide at the bottom of the Karat Fjord. An earthquake measuring 4.0 on the Richter scale had caused 45 million cubic meters of earth and rock to plunge as far as 1,300 meters, creating a 90 meter high tsunami wave at the point of impact. This resulted in that these two villages are still unlivable uh, today because there is a threat of more landslides and tsunamis. Now, our traditional knowledge, um, especially in areas with ice, has taught us how to avoid tsunamis, to be extra careful when we are by the shores. But landslides triggered by earthquakes and because of the melting permafrost, creating unstable soil is not something that our traditional knowledge can warn us um, against because they do not have the same warning signs as a iceberg, for instance, turning over. Now, we have witnessed the climate change in the Arctic over several decades. As you in Europe are experiencing droughts, floods and storms increasingly these past few years, we have now reached a point where our traditional knowledge is no longer as reliable as it used to be. And even though we pride ourselves of our adaption through centuries and millennia in living in the Arctic, our adaptability is under threat. Now on this note, before we into, into inner traditional knowledge, I would like to talk a bit about these knowledge systems. Now, knowledge systems are ways of knowing and navigating the world. But it's also how we view the world. And traditionally, we talk about traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and local knowledge. And they're often used interchangeably. And to further the confusion, ecological, the term ecological, also sneaks in. And then we have to navigate between traditional <laughs> ecological knowledge local ecological knowledge, traditional indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and local knowledge, and so on. Now, to my understanding, traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge are passed down through generations. There is a historical aspect to it, whereas local knowledge is more place specific and does not necessarily have historical roots. Now, however, UNESCO describes local and indigenous knowledge as follows. Local and indigenous knowledge refers to understandings, skills, and philosophies developed by societies with long histories of interaction with their natural surroundings. For rural and indigenous peoples, local knowledge informs decision-making about fundamental aspects of day-to-day -day life. This knowledge is integral to a cultural complex that also encompasses language systems of classification, resource use, practices, social interactions, ritual, and spirituality. These unique ways of knowing are important facets of the world's cultural diversity and provide a foundation for locally appropriate sustainable development. And I do completely agree that the confusion becomes real because then how do we navigate between using traditional knowledge, traditional indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, uh, and just indigenous knowledge, and ecological as well. Of course, it depends on what we're working with, but we have to be careful about how we include it um, or how we talk about it when we're talking about the different knowledge systems. Now, the way that I use traditional knowledge is in combination with the terms indigenous and ecological because of my specific place in time and space. I use the term to describe a network of knowledges, beliefs, and traditions that are intended to preserve, communicate, and contextualize indigenous relationships with cultural landscape. In a sense, I use it in the same way that I would intangible cultural heritage, a concept that we are all very familiar with in this group. It is the living culture that grounds us in place and teaches us through ancestral experiences how to not only survive, but live adaptively in the Arctic, 
both on a short term basis and over time. Now, besides being a uh, former curator, former keeper of the 2003 convention and a heritage manager, I am also an archaeologist. Uh, so I will just quickly give you a history lesson. Galatli Canal uh, Greenland has had, as you can see on this image, several cultures living uh, and dying on this island. When our culture, the Inuit culture, um, reached the island about a thousand years ago, it happened with unprecedented speed across the Arctic. Just few generations in, an Inuit lived along the coast of Greenland. And when they came, the Dorset culture, or Lake Dorset, as you can see on the screen, were living in Northwest Greenland, and the Norse lived in the south of the island. Now, the reason why our culture spread so quickly is because of our transportation um, systems. The Umiak, which is a big boat, the kayak, which you know as a kayak, and the dog sled are completely, for this time being, innovative transportation devices, which help Inuit navigate and spread out over the Arctic at an incredible speed. Now, the Umiak retired about 80 years ago, but the kayak and the dog sled are still living parts of our culture. And as you can see on this image on the right side, you have a drawing from 1721 by the first um, colonizer to Greenland, Hans Ill, depicting ice hunting with dog sled teams. And on the image on the left, um, there's a photograph of Ushaya Kreutzmann by Visa Greenland and how we are still using the dog sleds and the teams and parts of the traditional clothing. You can see he's wearing seal skin, um, Chemex and dog skin pants. He's having wrapped caribou skin on his um, dog sled to keep warm. So many of these aspects that has been documented 300 years ago are still very much alive in our culture today. Now, traditional knowledge is the basis for learning the art of mushing, how to control your dog team and how to teach them how to run, um, of training the dog team, for learning the environment, reading the snow, also known as snow how, and reading the weather, as well as where to be extra careful for the threat of avalanches when you're moving around snow-covered mountains. The same goes for the kayak, Traditional knowledge concerning the sea and the weather can mean life or death. So as you can see, um, traditional knowledge, the living heritage is guiding us still through how to navigate and have rich, full lives in the Arctic. However, the climate crisis is impacting how the weather reacts. Now, this photo is from 2019, up by Karnak in Northwest Greenland. And as you can see, it looks like the dogs are running in a tropical ocean. Um, they are on the sea ice, but the top layer of it melted and created this dangerous environment. So the climate crisis is very much real here and it's affecting the traditional ways of living and navigating uh, the Arctic. And in 2014, this amazing book came out, The Meaning of Ice, um, People and Sea Ice in Three Arctic Communities. And in it, the authors are really explaining and making available the knowledge of what it means if we have no ice in the Arctic, because the ice is our way of maintaining food security through hunting and harvesting. It is providing us with sustainable and suitable clothes to live in the Arctic, where we are using still everything from the animals. It's cultural enrichment. It's going out with your dog teams on the weekend, um, spending time with family and friends. It's living heritage where you can 
connect over the, the rich cultural legacies and knowing that for thousands of years, people have been moving around with these dog teams in the Arctic. It is a way of keeping the traditional knowledge um, alive. And of course it's part of tradition, but we are uh, nearing the point where our traditional knowledge is becoming increasingly unreliable because of the way that the winters for some reason have become longer, but with more melt periods means that our snow how does not um, translate into how the sea and the ice are reacting today. The water is getting warmer, but the air is still cold. So you're having these frictions between um, water and air. And it's really very much affecting the way that we are living here in the Arctic. So on this depressing note, I would just like to say, Poyana, thank you for your attention. This is Nuuk, um, as it very much looked like today, the snow has hardly melted yet, which is very depressing since it's the 1st of June next week. <laughs> but thank you for listening to me. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm sure we can have them later on. Yes, thank you, Kirstine, for your fantastic maybe a bit uh, sad on the side, <laughs> sad side uh, presentation, but wonderful uh, look into it. Definitely gave us a lot to think about. Uh, as, uh, indeed, if you have questions for Christine, uh, please, you can already write them to the chat, uh, chat box so we can return to them later on then. But now it would be time for our guest, Riz Evans, to join us from Norway, I suppose. That's right. I am from joining you from Southwest Norway, where it is pitching down rain. Basically, when I was asked to to participate in this, I wasn't quite sure what to say. But what I've brought here is something that's emerged from a lot of work that I've done recently. Um, and it is about sustainability. And it is about indeed um, uh, in, in particular, the relationship between um, intangible and natural cultural heritage and these new uh, opportunities. And at the same time, this presentation is a, a plea, an argument that community should lie at the heart of the articulation of all of this, that, that when we think about sustainability, community is often the last part thought about, especially by large formal institutions. Uh, and it is in fact this which has which has caused my institution to move into a field that we call regenerative development, which takes sustainable development one step further uh, and is, you know, is based built upon the principles of regenerative agriculture, but goes much further than that. This presentation, however, is that argument for community, and it's based upon, as it says here, three uh, Norway Czech bilateral projects uh, and two other projects, one about native breed horses and the other uh, about uh, schust culture, about uh, coastal cultures, and also another one about, uh, well, this Liva Fjusup. Uh, project with these uh, gamma fiosa. So based upon all of that, uh, and a whole lot of collaborations, which I'm not going to spend any time going through, this is at this point now history. <laughs> um, the idea was to kind of explore the possibilities for sustainable community development through the development of cultural heritage assets and particularly intangible cultural assets. Now, when I use the word assets, I'm referring to something very specific, which is the asset-based rural community development model with its five types of capitals or assets. Um, uh, and the reason why is, is because this was the first time that communities actually got to contribute things to development and be acknowledged for it that they previously hadn't before. And these things became assets. And cultural heritage assets, knowledge, stories, narrative, 
old buildings even, are often collectively owned in an informal way. And particularly that's so with intangible cultural heritage, such as knowledge and narrative. Um, you, we have traditional tradition owners and tradition, you know, passer honors. Um, in fact, I don't know if you know, but the word tradition itself actually means to communicate when it comes from the from the original Latin. Uh, and so uh, um, tradition is communication. Hmm. The purpose, though, of all of this is to kind of link these these two things, you know, cultural heritage and sustainable community development in ways that show obvious paths forward, particularly for people who are keepers of intangible cultural heritage. And so, of course, we've got these two kinds of uh, cultural heritage assets, tangible, intangible. You all know about that, I'm sure. And then I want to identify two scales, large and small scale. And particularly, I want to point to the value of small scale, intangible cultural heritage. Local knowledge is local practices, local heritage is local social biology, i.e. the native breed animals and plants. And to a certain extent, you can kind of say that, you know, you've got these two specific types of cultural heritage. And they sort of correspond with, yeah? Which is why I can say I'm interested in small scale, intangible cultural heritage. And the reason I'm interested is, is because in many rural communities, you know, there's this problem with job loss that uh, requires, you know, that creates for a rural depopulation and this need to build this vocational transition. Um, very often that's where a lot of cultural heritage is still found, is relict, is remnant, hasn't been paved over entirely yet. Um, so the, those two things go together. Uh, and basically, it's a simple task. The use of cultural heritage assets involves moving them from their original economic activity for which they were designed into a new sector where their value is appreciated. Now, the good news is this involves usually a transition from the production sector to the service sector. And of course, the service sector is a dominant part of the modern global economy in many of the fastest growing subsectors of that service or consumer sector intangible cultural heritage assets are be a key part of them and most cultural her heritage assets have a kind of a biography which works this way not all but the ones particularly i'm talking about these things at one point were the most effective and efficient way of producing commodities necessary to make a living, whether it's old boats or farm horses or you name it. At some point, they get replaced by a disruptive technology, the most common one, of course, being the internal combustion engine, and abandoned by the sector. Some remain or and are saved by museums or groups of enthusiasts, but like if it's an old boat, a lot of them just rot on the shore. But these ones that are saved then become the, the basis of a range of modern services which are delivered by communities who care about them. And these services include education, well-being, tourism, delivered by both private and community-based enterprises. And it turns out that a lot of this, these intangible cultural heritages can be assets for the creation of sustainable community enterprises. So when you think about them, you can think about them going from production <laughs> to preservation to the culture and experience economy. <clears throat> the reason why I want this, I'm trying to put this together is, is that community development can be the pivot around which so much other sustainable development turns.
Yeah. When we talk about sustainable development, of course, we're talking about the threefold environmental, economic, social, and cultural. When we put community development at the core of it, it assures that environmental resources remain available for use by subsequent generations, that the economic resources pass to the whole community, not just an elite or outside investors, and that benefits accrue across all levels of society, and that investment in the community becomes investment in the capacity of individuals. That's why it matters. And it also, that's why it ties together environment and economy. But of course, communities and local rural entrepreneurs need something to develop. And that something has to have both a local heritage relevance and be relevant in use in the modern, you know, in the modern economy, particularly in, uh, you know, health and well-being or education or in community-based tourism. And so cultural heritage resources at the small scale, and in particular, the coupling of material assets and intangible assets provide a compelling case for building education, health, or community-based tourism. All of these intangible and tangible cultural heritages point the way forward for local rural communities who need assets to, to develop, assets which express their culture, their history, and their contemporary identity. By developing such assets to deliver education, social work, and tourist activities, communities can build economic activities which reinforce their local identity, assure that traditions remain alive, deliver new economic benefits, not only for the community organization, but more widely in the community itself. And I've seen this time and time again in Scotland, in Norway, in Czech, in Slovakia. There are large opportunities for rural communities to identify and develop smaller scale cultural and natural heritage assets to produce local products, local food, outdoor recreation, tourism, cultural heritage, tourism, participation in the green economy, education, lo building local identity, all of that can be taken from these type of resources. And at the same time, smaller scale cultural and natural heritage assets will be preserved and brought back into the community who will maintain them, not necessarily with government funding, but perhaps through trading income they've earned themselves. Of course, there's a challenge. There's some challenges to this. You know, we have to meet them uh, sort of face on, I guess. You know, I'm, the first one, I find this all over Central Europe is a lack of respect for the capacity of rural people and communities. And yet when you look and see those here acting, you can see that there's plenty of capacity, plenty of desire there um you know there's there are issues about you know by existing communities who control culture you know the arts world especially in uh, central europe there are places whereby there hasn't there still is a lot of change yet to come there's also a lack of understanding of the value of these assets in the modern world and a need for education and uh some you know some some role models to inspire others to take this up now I've had, I've got a current project called, what's it called, Bohemian, Bohemian Diamond? And then it's attempt to catalog South Bohemian handwork, which is old cultural heritage practice, on a digital, digital catalog to inspire cutting edge designers in Praha. be interesting to see how that how that works out and i i did have an early an earlier project with the uh, united nations university in prague um looking at uh creating uh learning material to inspire young people to take up these handcrafts um 
these challenges can be can be addressed. So I think you know, all over, Norway, Scotland, the Faroes, where you are, we can see more and more examples of how tangible and intangible cultural heritage can be can be used in the delivery of experience services such as education, tourism, and well-being uh, recreation. And at the same time, both private and community enterprises arise to service the demand to both experience the asset, but to also um, maintain it as well. So in conclusion, cultural and natural heritage assets, both material and intangible, can be key assets for the development of new services, and particularly around sustaining you know, environmental services. Some of these assets are small scale and available to local or sub-local communities of enthusiasts to develop. This development addresses the need to build sustainability, especially economic and, and environmental sustainability into community development because it aims at generating trading income. And alongside the amazing large cultural heritage assets in Czech or anywhere else, you know, the opera houses and massive railway museums, there are many, many places where there are plenty of smaller scale assets. By identifying and supporting development of these small scale cultural heritage assets, not only will they be preserved and indeed enhanced, but the local communities in which they are situated will gain an enhanced ability to make a vocational transition into sustainable rural economy. So, you know, this is why community matters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Riz, for your presentation. But now uh, it would be time to move on in our program. Okay, so so greetings uh, to this community. Uh, I guess possibly the very south and uh, point uh, from this community, from very south of Lithuania, from Musteka village, uh, which is an ethnocultural um, reserve in the Zukia National Park. and. Uh, I will I will go to, to to I mean the title of the presentation is uh, dealing about the empathy towards the nature um, uh, uh, and uh, and cultural heritage and um, uh, just a little uh, to to give uh, you an, an idea of my context uh, so which might be important to understand. Uh, why I draw to one of the other conclusions. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, myself, I am a biologist um, and nature conservationist by profession. So professional nature conservationist. So sustainability is kind of my everyday, everyday work. Um, so first of all, I look from that perspective, but at the same time, I also, I am also a farmer. I'm also a member of a nice Musteka village community. And uh, I am no way, professional, but definitely a cultural heritage, heritage enthusiast myself. Um, and um, uh, talking about the today's webinar, uh, key question, uh, how living heritage links to the ecological sustainability. I, yeah, I try to focus or to see Musteka village exactly from this, uh, this point of view. But my my side, my biologist side, or my nature conservationist side, immediate immediate answer to this question would be that uh, I would look into the cultural heritage that uh, this living heritage is is actually part of the natural processes driving the ecosystem, driving the ecosystem succession, and supporting uh, protect the species which we are already protecting or, or supporting the the dynamics of the natural ecosystems and uh, just to give you some examples also coming from my region is uh, just uh, for for instance the moss collection uh, for the livestock for the livestock bedding uh, in our region uh, not practiced anymore but but still recently has been practiced uh, creates a habitat for the for, for the flower which you see on the on on the right uh, picture and uh, and uh, for which it is important to have uh, quite a lot of open soil and uh, and and because such practices are mostly abandoned uh, 
Uh, this flower is getting rare and currently is protected, I believe, not only in Lithuania, but throughout the whole Europe. Uh, another example, the traditional pastoralism, which is also a picture taken uh, with cows from Mustaka village, I think uh, something like uh, 25 years ago, I guess. Um, uh, the pastoralism as such tradition, shepherds uh, and, and cows, they are, they are shaping the traditional landscape, uh, which is uh, important also. It creates a very specific habitat or uh, grazing cows in forests and in, in meadows, creates a very specific habitat, which are also currently protected under the directives of European Union. But it is also is a home for, for the bird like this, Koopa or, or rollers or many, uh, many other species. So that's an important element which replaced the, the megafauna, the large herbivores uh, been roaming tens of thousands of years ago uh, in our region. Another example is skiting the, or mowing with a, with a skite. Um, is safe for the meadows and it also creates a mosaic structure which is so necessary, so important for the whole biodiversity. So birds, insects, uh, butterflies and so on. So these kind of a traditions uh, were kind of a key preconditions uh, to, to, for biodiversity uh, in, in the, in the agroecosystems, in the meadows and pastures. But, uh, but looking more looking deeper a little bit or already being as cultural heritage enthusiast, not so much as a biologist profession, professional, uh, I want to look also to the perception uh, of native people uh, on the nature and human relationships, how the local, local people perceive uh, nature, how they understand nature, what is their relationship with nature. And um, uh, uh, scientists of the environmental ethics uh, structure these perceptions into basically two categories. There are more, more ways to, to structure it, but, but this kind of one of the mainstream is to see that uh, there is one so-called anthropocentric perspective, which is human-centered philosophy, where, where we see nature as a resource for people. So it delivers a practical value. So the nature is valuable to, to people only if it delivers a practical value as a resource. And, um, and here the human is seen, you know, standing on the top of, of, of the world, on the top of nature, and is separated from, from the nature as such, which is uh, quite a dominant uh, view in the Catholic tradition. While uh, the other perspective is so-called the ecocentric perspective, uh, where nature is seen also as intrinsic value. So a value as itself. So it doesn't have to deliver practical benefits to people. It is, it is an intrinsic value. And it is seen that the nature is actually a home which is shared with, with, with the other species. So the human is not standing on the top, but is among the other species. And here the human looks uh, into the coexistence with the nature, which is very common in, in, in ancient religions also reflecting, and also in the remains, uh, which I reflected uh, in the old traditions as Rhys uh, titled them an assets. And uh, just to, to bring these two perspectives of the two philosophies in the current uh, environmental crisis in the current situation on our planet where we live in the culture of uh, consumerism uh, where the con consumer society is is highly driven by the anthropocentric perspective seeing nature as a, as a resource and uh, and and seeing themselves as being masters of the world and actually this perception is exactly the root cause to the environmental crisis we have today, to the climate change crisis, to the biodiversity crisis. This is uh, this perception is is the root cause to to, to to the situation where we face. And here you can also see the tree cut uh, down in the alley in one of the places in Lithuania, which is perfectly healthy, but the necessity to, to cut the tree was uh, the necessity to enlarge the road. To, to, and actually to make a bicycle road, to make people more comfort in driving, connecting one city with the other city. 
Um, so going back to to Mustaka village and uh, going back to the the autochtons or or native people, local people. Um, um, when you look into their perspective you know, into nature, what is their perception? I, I call it really empathic coexistence with the nature. And this is, uh, this is exactly, is, to my mind, is a key value in the cultural heritage which we have uh, inherited, which, um, which is, um, um, Lena in her presentation mentions, uh, in her opening speech mentions, but these little examples are like little drops to sustainability. Uh, but I think that exactly the, the empathic coexistence perspective of the local people or, or autochtons or natives is a massive asset uh, to, to really to solve uh, or the ma key really solving this environmental crisis here. So this kind of, this is the roots on which we can uh, obviously base the uh, uh, base our further decisions or, or you know, get inspirations from these traditions and uh, this perspective to nature is still alive in our villages and uh, and um, and it is coded in our traditions and rituals and, and surprisingly where you see it, the picture the the man uh, in western Lithuania in, in during the spring flood in his yard actually um, uh, is uh, those people who live in in quite um, um, extreme environments, they have a very, they have even stronger empathy and even stronger respect to nature, and they really have to say have a perspective of not to fight nature, to rule nature, but rather to exist with nature. And um, in our village, we we these perspectives. Uh, are uh, really can see in many other practice in many practices and many traditions. Uh, uh, you see, you see the picture of uh, from from the workshop on the traditional carpentry, which uh, we organized. Our community organized in Mustaka is really uh, revealing the secrets uh, or, or moments when is the best to, to cut wood and when is best not to disturb nature. Uh, we have um, in our village also the ancient, um, uh, still remaining ancient Easter rituals where we color Easter eggs, but also children are also walking from doors to doors uh, for, for seeking for the eggs, exchanging the eggs and, and blessing the houses. The, you see in the patterns of eggs also the very attentive um, elements uh, of nature and, uh, and uh, really. Uh, I would say the, the, the representation of a circle of life, I would say. Uh, we do have the old tree beekeeping tradition in Mistaka, which uh, trains, uh, which really uh, trains us to, to, to be attentive to the nature rhythm, but also trains us, you know, to, har to, uh, um, to harvest the honey also sustainably, not, you know, to maximize the to, and take away all the honey which is you know harvested but also to leave uh, the part for the honey for the bees so bees can survive i my neighbor biruta um, uh, picking mushrooms so so and and also berries uh, this is the traditions which is very much viable in our region and in our village in, uh, in particular um, is a is a nice example when she picks a mushroom um, she carefully puts the moss back to hide the hole where the mushroom has been to, to make sure how to say that the soil is well covered and the next year we will have more mushrooms to grow. So really a very attentive perception uh, to, to, to the nature and, and really seeking for their coexistence. And um, I was uh, living in, 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 in Mustaka village already for a while and um, and I was thinking, where are, what really are the key ingredients? How to develop such a sensitive uh, coexistence with nature? What are the key ingredients in the recipe? And, uh, and, and my ingredients, I think, first of all, is slowliness, being slowly and, and you know, live slowly. It is attentive listening 
attentive seeing and attentive hearing of the environment. So really observing the environment where slowliness is a must, you know, otherwise if you do it quick, you, you, can't, you can't really see uh, uh, and feel uh, really sense of place. So mindful sense of place is also a very important, a very important aspect in, in, in seeking this coexistence with nature. And, um, and to summarize lastly, how to say the, 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 the two messages as a biologist, so definitely these uh, living heritage traditions are part of a natural ecosystem dynamics processes, which maintains a healthy ecosystem. And the other, I would, I would like to rephrase, um, uh, remembering also Rees uh, mentions uh, the assets. I think this exactly very sensitive and very attentive uh, perspective seeing human nature relationship, uh, uh, which is coded in our traditions in our, our, our everyday rituals is, uh, is, is really a huge asset uh, to solve uh, or to, to, to solve environmental challenges okay? and to educate also our society uh, to show the path how these uh, environmental problems can be solved. That was, uh, yeah, my short, uh, short intervention. Thank you, Tsimandas. That was just excellent. I think we are all quite inspired by what you tell and uh, also the pictures that you showed gives a lot, loads of, of food to discuss afterwards also in small groups, then I'm sure of that. Hello, um, my name is Elva Lien, Sigruna Pietusdóttir, and I am uh, the director of the Technical Museum in East Iceland. Um, along with another colleague, um, uh, and we are situated in a small town called Seydisfjörður, where uh, tourism is thriving at the moment. We have a cruise ship with 1,500 people roaming the streets, and, and so, so um, experience-based tourism, living heritage, uh, sustainability, ecological, social, cultural and, and, and financial or economical are all a very big part of our lives. Uh, I am very pleased of being spe of speaking here and I, I really would like to thank the earlier speakers for very inspiring talks. The main focus of the Technical Museum of East Iceland has been uh, on the influx of modern times from around 1880 to 1950. Topics have included technical innovations in areas such as mechanics, electricity, communications, shipbuilding, commerce and architecture, and how they interlace the changes in lifestyle in Seydisjörður and in Iceland in general. The museum emphasized on the intangible heritage in its activities. It held workshops, courses, uh, and collaborated with different uh, parties. Uh, and it was aiming at different groups, younger and older students, artists, handymen, and others. Here we can see photos uh, from the Blacksmith Festival, an annual festival that has been held, as well as other that show a little bit about the activities that we were working with. Also, um, the first telegraph station in Iceland uh, was here in Seydisfjörður, and the museum has the original equipment. Um, and here we can see the former station manager and telegraphist Johan Gretar work the, the, the original equipment. Um, you just have to think about the sounds, do, 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 the more sounds. It's a very short video. He's actually writing something that makes sense there. It is an incredible. Uh, skill and knowledge. However, on December 18th, mid-afternoon, the largest landslide ever to hit a town in Iceland came down on the outskirts of Seyðisjörður after the highest recorded rainfall over five days in Iceland. 
the rainfall for those five days uh, plus uh, maybe for the for the 10 days before uh, the landslide uh, almost reached the annual main uh, rainfall in in or precipitation in in Reykjavik the, the capital of, of of Iceland sorry I'm having um this equals to almost one meter of water uh, excuse me i'm trying to get my my mouse to to come to the other screen which of course it doesn't yeah this equals to almost one meter of water covering the whole town and the hillsides up to the snow lines. And this was unprecedented and very unusual weather conditions that can most likely be uh, linked to climate change. The museum lost three houses, two were damaged, and the area that the museum was at were, has since then been declared as a permanent danger zone and cannot be protected. Uh, that is it, one of the reasons for that is that we have a thawing permafrost frost high up in the hills above the town or where you can, uh, which is one of the main reasons why the area cannot be, be protected by defense structures. Sorry, I really need to get the mouse over to the other screen. There it is. The many historic houses that the landslide devastated, as well as the destruction of a good part of the museum collection, can be considered one of the greatest damages to Iceland's cultural and architectural heritage in recent times. Um, fortunately, there were no casualties, even though 30 people, about 30 people were in the area when the landslide hit, but uh, almost 30 people lost their homes and 12 institutions or companies were heavily uh, in, affected by this and lost their facilities. Uh, the museum collection uh, was excavated from the landslide. It was put into large fish tubs where groups of conservators and museum specialists ev evaluated each item, whether it should be kept or not. And what we did at this time, it was just, uh, it was, of course, a really strange time is that we just tried to deal with one ridiculous problem at a time. There were a lot of things to think about how we, what we could save of the collection, um, the housing situation. Now we are thinking about new housing, a new location for the museum outside of danger zones, um, the new policy, what the museum should be funding and staff well-being has, was also very important because we were all in a trauma at the same time as dealing with, with this over, overwhelming task. At this time, the collection is in a temporary but unsuitable storage facilities, uh, and we have not yet sold uh, that, 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 that thing where, where we can use keep our collection. Um, uh, we lost the main pillars of our hands-on equipment in the landslide, the blacksmith and all this part of the workshop that we had, as well as a, a very interesting uh, print shop with unique equipment, they were lost and we are currently homeless. So what do we not, now need to do? So the core of the, def so the core defining element of the reconstructed museum to make sure that that will be the living intangible heritage, the know-how and hands-on experience that was also uh, the defining element of the museum before. We have been working on a new policy uh, where a lot of people have come to the, to, to the table with different views. We uh, tried to have a close dialogue with the community. We have done stakeholder mapping. We are testing and trying different things learning from best practice, we're trying to widen our network, for example, the living project, to see how we can make sure that this will be a part, uh, you know, like, like a, 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 the, one of the main pillars of the new museum. When will we have a new museum? Here you can see uh, 
just like the very first plans that we have, uh, the designing process has started. An older building that you see here, uh, you see an old photo of the building, which is in a very bad shape at the moment. It will be moved from the, this permanent danger zone to a new location. And then we plan on building another house that will be based on a house that the landslide destroyed. And they, it will have a pier outside. And, and we have we have high hopes, but time, money, perseverance, and enthusiasm are needed to make that happen. We want to build a living museum with diverse exhibitions, events, workshops, and facilities that will be a place that the guests of Say the City need to visit, but at the same time in close relationship and dialogue with locals. We have uh, ideas about uh, in, that in the new housing, we will have some kind of a multi-purpose workshop with a, not, not like a specific uh, a blacksmith or a carpentry, but, but have a, a multi-purpose space where we can do different things, have collaboration with clubs and associations. Um, we still want to keep this annual blacksmith festival going. We want to keep this in mind in our exhibition design. Um, in the new collection policy, uh, we have identified that we are not uh, that some items will be registered as props, but not the museum items. And we want to encourage uh, and and facilitate facilitate research. Uh, there is a question of whether we would like to have a residency where we can invite artists or scholars or others to students to um, to stay for some extended period of time. And of course, it is very important that we will have a collaboration with other cultural and educational institutions. In the new policy, uh, we emphasize that the uh, museum is, will be a living museum where it will have an emphasis on preserving labor skills and know-how and guest participation and the communication of the intangible cultural heritage. It wants to be creative informative and rewarding in its communication. Speak to different target groups uh, and aim to offer accessibility to all and to include uh, the subjects and topics of sustainability and environmental issues at the core of its activities and the subjects it will address in its communication. This, these are high ambitions, but we are sure that we will, um, that they will become fruitful in time. And um, this is a very short overview of, 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 of the situation that we are dealing with. And uh, actually, I'd, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to stop cheering. Okay, thank yes. you, Evelyn. Yes. Excellent. It worked nice. And uh, do you find the right buttons for the stop sharing? Stop sharing. Here it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. I would just like to thank you all, and and it has been it's really inspiring to be part of this project, and and I think we will learn a lot from it to build a new new museum where living heritage uh, and sustainable in all its different forms will be at the core of the museum activities. Thank you. Thank you, Elvalin. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and sorry for this uh, technical misunderstanding. So I'm happy to be here with you. And um, so I, I'm from Serde and Serde is an artist uh, and researcher collective. And I will introduce shortly what we do. So we have three main programs. Uh, one is cultural heritage. Uh, second one is artists in residences and then intangible culture heritage. And the culture heritage, uh, we have a program because we have a very old house complex. This is uh, under protection of uh, state um, monuments and um, this is how we started in 2002 um, and this is our residency center we do the restoration programs and uh, educational programs how to restore uh, your house if you have old house and what to do so now we look 
a bit better than in 2002. This is uh, already 20 years uh, history. What we have done there and our program is uh, artist in residency and uh, people are coming from different countries to work on their own projects or also to join for um, different symposiums, lectures and festivals. And all this happens only during the summertime because we have old house and this is not possible to heat it during the winter. And um, just a few examples what we have in our, our town. If you pass through Aispute, you can see some nice examples what uh, artists left in our town. This is Apple Mural by artist Silve Grace Borda. Then every year we have an international cast iron symposium. And as the result is night, which uh, guards Livonian order castle ruins and the locals love it and they dress him up uh, for every celebration and every event. And then we have pandas and many people are questioning why pandas, uh, because we had the artist uh, who lives in, in Finland that originally is from Japan, Yasushi Koyama, and he, he dedicated his sculpture for um, um, uh, mothers and kids because they are also so rare in nice Ice as pandas. So, and Intangible Culture Heritage uh, Program, uh, we have uh, expeditions, publications, and also events. Expeditions means that we, go, we are going um, for um, field works, we collect uh, memories of uh, different times from Soviet period and even, even uh, older and also skills. And then we always uh, gather material and transcribe it and uh, give it back audience as publications and also some public events. On 2016, we also got accreditation by UNESCO as an um, advisory organization for intangible culture heritage. And um, so one of our first uh, expedition and first project in um, living heritage and uh, was about vodka making, which was illegal about that time, uh, but that was very interesting and many people um, enjoyed it and uh, participated and shared the recipes and uh, we also traveled a lot, a lot abroad with this project, so we even got a folklore prize innovation in tradition about this project because we did research, we did uh, presentations and we also get, did a publication about this tradition. Uh, we have about 23 publications which is about different uh, skills, about different stories, local history in different places and um, now we are working on food uh, heritage. So, but I was invited because we also had uh, one very interesting project about uh, foraging in Central Kurzeme. This was our first uh, international uh, expedition and it was on 2010 when we invited about uh, 30 people who came here to Aispute from um, different uh, Baltic and Nordic countries. There was artists, journalists and researchers and also uh, local youngsters from Idea House who helped a lot with translations and also transcribing of the material later. So we did research and we call it a sprint, like expedition sprint, because during the two weeks we organize field works, interviews in two places, Aispute and Alsunga. We collect stories, we did documentation, photos and um, later on the second week we, tra we transcribe and all the interviews was all, all already translated by youngsters. So um, yes and here we can see that there is a top three what we find we, uh, we question people what they use um, what kind of plants they use when they heal 
some diseases. So, uh, and the top three is stinghorn, which is actually mushroom. The second is birch, but all parts of the birch is possible to use. And then uh, on the third is different plants and also apple, blueberry, yeah, and flowers, sweet flag, corn flower. Uh, people share their recipes, how they use it. Usually this is tea, infusions in spirit, or you dry it and also it is as powder. And here is, um, the most surprising uh, findings, what we find uh, during this research, what people use. And these are beaver glands, uh, what people say that this is against cancer cells and this is still very popular in Latvia. And almost every family has a story about fresh cow's dung with warm milk because cow eats uh, grass and in this process somehow it becomes very healthy if you press uh, in warm milk. And uh, also mushrooms and healing with ants is uh, very uh, good for, for um, to, to get away headaches and as well snakes and toads in spirits you can use for against joint pain. Uh, this research also leads us uh, to continue and to many other um, sub-projects. One of that was Folk Pharmacy. Folk Pharmacy was um, inspired by um, foraging expedition because we find that many ladies has uh, herbs on their window sills and how they use them, how they grow it and um, what, are, what are the most popular recipes. And we also set up ex exhibition. Uh, during uh, exhibition, we exchange our newspaper uh, with uh, some recipes what people who came to visit our ex exhibition. Uh, so we gather actually material um, for our book from new recipes what nowadays people use when they feel sick. And also allotment garden is one of the sub project after this folk pharmacy and foraging because we for three years experimented uh, experimented uh, what uh, can grow in um, vertical gardens on different uh, leftover um, flower beds and also what can be used as food and as medicine. And it ended in 2014 with a Freedom Garden during the Riga Culture Capital City. Yeah, for Europe, uh, Riga Europe Culture Capital City project. So, and always when we do our researches and work with artists, we, uh, at the end of season, we invite everybody for art and craft market when we combine all these practices and findings. And this year it will be on 10 of September. So you are very welcome to join us and also to show something what you are interested to share. So welcome and see you in Serde. Thank you, Signe. That was nicely done. Beautiful to see this Prezi presentation for a change too. <laughs> Because of the technical problems, we are now running a bit late. So if we would now, I mean, it's it's quite good going questions and answers on the chat box. But please, all speakers, if you still have a look, if there are some questions for you, we could now maybe have a cup of coffee, a six minute break yes. for that. And then we could come back and all this pressure of, of discussing and talking would be left to the small groups where you will meet new colleagues in nice, cozy, small groups.